The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Mapping the Path to Better Patient Outcomes in Rheumatoid Arthritis and Psoriatic Arthritis. Need to know information and practical guidance about JAK inhibitors for advanced practice providers. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash ZHN860. Downloadable infographics and additional resources are also available. Hi, this is Dr. Len Calabrese. I'm a professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine in Cleveland, Ohio. Welcome to this unique educational activity focusing on the role of JAK inhibitors in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. RA and PSA are common chronic inflammatory diseases that are characterized by pain and swelling in the joint and a propensity for destructive arthritis. RA is a prevalent disease in rheumatology practices, and there are estimated about 1.5 million Americans, about 1% of the population that has it. Psoriatic arthritis is even more prevalent if we do the math. There's about 8 million Americans that have psoriasis, and somewhere between 1 in 10 and 3 in 10 have elements of psoriatic arthritis, but it's under-recognized. Both of these conditions, if not diagnosed and treated early, can lead to progressive joint destruction with loss of function and a variety of extra articular manifestations. If we look at the differences in RA and PSA from the clinical perspective, there are really more similarities than differences. On the other hand, the distribution of the joints disease is often different. Propensity for distal interphalangeal and joint involvement only in psoriatic arthritis, axial spine disease, which we don't consider part of the rheumatoid spectrum, and then prominent anthocytis and dactylitis and psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, all very, very important. Some of the extra-articular manifestations differ, such as interstitial lung disease seen predominantly in RA. So from the serologic perspective, RA is a seropositive disease and three-quarters positive ACPA and rheumatoid factor. Psoriatic arthritis, by definition, is seronegative. If we look at it from the immunologic perspective, there are many shared pathways, such as TNF being important in both, but a propensity for upregulation of Th17 pathway in psoriatic arthritis that is not as prominent in rheumatoid arthritis. Radiographically, in their fully developed form, these diseases are easily differentiable, but it's not always that clear. We don't see pencil and cup deformities very often at all anymore in psoriatic arthritis. Spine involvement can be subtle or just inflammatory back pain, but the presence of bony proliferation is a major differentiator and characteristic of psoriatic arthritis, as well as the pattern when we see distal interphalangeal joint involvement. I think it's important to turn and face the patient now and look at the impact of RA on quality of life. These two figures really tell you the story from the patient's perspective. Patients with rheumatoid arthritis will often say that they value a day without fatigue as much as a day without pain. But when we examine psoriatic disease, we see something a bit different that has not been focused on as much in rheumatoid arthritis. And that is the perspective of depression and emotional issues related to skin or joint symptoms, which certainly can include a sense of embarrassment, particularly when this is in cosmetically sensitive areas. And depression has been particularly linked with psoriasis, but it's also seen in rheumatoid disease as well. Now let's talk a little bit about pathogenesis. And here's a figure that really starts at a dendritic cell presenting a peptide to a T cell with a cognate receptor that is a naive T cell, and it ultimately will be polarized into a number of different cytokine-producing subsets. These are somewhat artificial and somewhat plastic as they can move back and forth. But as you can see, the generation of a Th1 response with its emblematic interferon gamma signature, it can be seen in both diseases, RA, psoriatic arthritis, and psoriasis, and may contribute to varying manifestations of disease. And as you know, these pathways are being targeted by numerous targeted therapies that have been highly effective. RA, it's a more complex issue. 
Well, there is upregulation of TH17 pathways. Targeted therapy to IL-17 has not been nearly as successful and is not approved for therapy. TH22 is intimately involved with TH17 cell pathways and can be seen to be perturbed in both sets of disorders. And finally, regulatory T cells, which are peripheral maintainers of self-tolerance, appear to be compromised in both conditions, though the clinical significance of this is far from clear. Now let's segue and talk about some therapies. And here, first we're talking about conventional synthetic DMARDs. If we ask what are the FDA-approved therapies in rheumatoid arthritis, virtually all of these conventional synthetic DMARDs are approved. In psoriatic arthritis, not so much. Even methotrexate, which is the gateway drug to use biologics and is actually demanded by most third-party carriers to start there, is not approved and used off-label. Certain drugs like cyclosporin are used very infrequently. Hydroxychloroquine is an RA drug, but not a PSA drug and may actually have some toxicities. And glucocorticoids have a very minimal role in the treatment of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. If we look at the growing list of targeted therapies, here we see TNF, IL-17s, 1223s, IL-6, IL-1, and then those molecules which target T cells and B cells. There are many similarities. TNFs are used across these diseases, but the IL-17s are heavy into psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. The IL-6 receptor antagonists that we have right now are RA-focused as well as IL-1 antagonists. And then some shared features in terms of abatacept T cell activation inhibitor has indications in both and B-cell therapy is limited to rheumatoid arthritis with very soft evidence of efficacy in psoriatic arthritis. Despite the richness of the DMARD palette of drugs and this growing palette of targeted therapies, we are still far from our goal. As many as 30 to 40 percent of patients with inflammatory arthritis of either sort have inadequate responses or intolerance to a stepwise program of starting with DMARD therapy and graduating to targeted therapy. And the response that the patient wants and the doctor wants is not met. There's also safety concerns and issues of inconvenience of route administration, many things to parse with the patient as we try to come up with an adequate and optimal treatment program. So there are other therapies that we have yet to discuss. And here are FDA-approved therapies for PSA or RA that we now call targeted synthetic oral small molecules. And while we think of them as primarily being kinase inhibitors, I uh, point out that apremilast has a major role in PSA, particularly those with modest joint and modest skin involvement, and that's a PDE4 inhibitor. The rest of these are JAK inhibitors, and I'd like to turn and now take a closer look at the latest evidence and clinical application of these molecules. At 30,000 feet, these JAK inhibitors, which stand for Janus kinase inhibitors, are molecules that inhibit the family of kinases. These kinases transfer phosphates from ATP to their targeted amino acid. The JAKs are primarily tyrosine kinases, and they belong to a large family of kinases that are encoded in the human genome. It's a complex array of molecules. And there's really a handful of JAKs, and these lead to phosphorylation of another set of proteins known as STATs, of which there is a slightly larger handful of. And they create an intracellular hub which connects the cell to its outside environment where it can sense stresses and changes in the environment and transmits a signal to the nucleus, which results in the transcription of RNA and the translation of hundreds of proteins to carry out varying biologic activities based upon the demands of what these extracellular sensors are perceiving. There are over 50 different molecules that can trigger the JAK-STAT pathway, and how it does it with just a few handfuls of these molecules is still being unraveled. But as you can see from this figure, JAKs function in pairs. JAK2 is the only homodimer but the others, such as JAK1, will pair with JAK3, JAK2, TIC2. So when you say this drug is the selective JAK1 inhibitor, it's actually inhibiting multiple JAKs. The overall balance of this depends upon the disease and the context. 
There are five prominent JAK inhibitors in late stage of development around the world. The four that we focus on in the United States and Europe are tofacitinib, baricitinib, upadacitinib, and filgotinib. Tofacitinib has been around for a number of years and has led the way in this, and it is a pan-JAK inhibitor. Baricitinib was the next to be approved and is primarily a JAK1, but with JAK2 effects, has been approved for rheumatoid arthritis and is not in advanced development for psoriatic-associated disease. Upadacitinib and filgotinib are more recent molecules in this field. Upadacitinib approved in 2019 for RA is in late-stage development for PSA and has been filed for in Europe and filgotinib is advancing in both of these and has been filed for for RA in the United States. So a very, very exciting field of molecules. So quickly to just review some of the high points, tofacitinib is approved for RA and PSA, and the development program for this was very robust, and there is clear evidence that it improves disease activity, signs and symptoms, quality of life, radiographic progression, and we can give this drug 5 milligrams twice a day or 11 milligrams once a day in these conditions. If we look at this figure that is assessing pain scores with tofacitinib across patients with RA, PSA, or spondyloarthritis, you can see the placebo and purple and the active drug comparator in several doses of which only the 5 milligram BID drug dose is approved in the arthritis. There's a clear separation that is sustained. I'll also point out that it is a quickly acting drug. Baricitinib, the next drug to be approved in this space, is only approved in rheumatoid arthritis. And it should be of note that it's only approved for patients who have had an inadequate response to one or more TNF antagonist therapies. It's two milligram dose, it's fixed. There are a variety of toxicities that have been associated with this, which are really class effects. And I'll talk about them in a summary fashion in a couple minutes. The clinical development program for all of these drugs was extremely robust with several thousand patients. And again, this drug improved disease activity, signs and symptoms, quality of life, radiographic progression across the board. Upadacitinib, the most recently approved drug, approved for RA, and PSA is a hopeful next indication, had a large development program, and evidence for all of the domains of these other two drugs that I have shared with you. Its dose is 15 milligrams once a day and shares many class-related toxicities and warnings of the other drugs. So we think of them as a class. And the psoriatic data, which was just presented at ULAR, looks very, very promising. And we may be hearing something about this soon, but only time will tell. So at high altitude, this is a general overview of the safety of JAK inhibitors across immune-mediated inflammatory diseases, or as we like to say, IMIDs. All of these drugs are associated with an increase of infections, and that includes ubiquitous mild infections, serious infections, opportunistic infections, including TB in endemic areas. But a class-associated characteristic infection is that all of them will increase the incidence of herpes zoster, which is the reactivation of varicella virus that is so common in our population and the risk factors in the general population are age and immunosuppressed states. This is characteristic of all the drugs that we have seen so far, and patients from Asia appear to be more vulnerable to this. Malignancies have been seen with all of these drugs, so the risks do not appear to be overly dramatic compared to targeted therapies, concerns about non-melanoma skin cancers and lymphomas, and there's detailed word in the package insert. These drugs are associated with a variety of laboratory toxicities and laboratory effects, I should really say, which include varying effects on anemia, leukopenia, dyslipidemia, transaminase elevation, CK elevation, and there is explicit wording about how these should be monitored. Most of these are mild and reversible, but we need to be aware of them when we use them. The atherogenic lipid profile, quote unquote, which is seen with these, is really not highly atherogenic since there is elevations of both LDL and HDL, and the ratio doesn't change. And detailed studies of these lipoproteins show that they actually take on a more anti-atherogenic phenotype with greater buffering capacity for oxidative stress. 
One relatively recent class-related effect, which is important to note, is a very small but palpable increase in thromboembolic events. And this really has been seen across the JAK programs. Whether it's associated with JAK2 related is a really unknown. And the risk is very, very small, but we should risk mitigate and avoid using them in people who have risk factors. The monitoring of these drugs is summarized on this slide. I've kind of described this to you about what baseline labs should be obtained and how they should be followed up to look at the dyslipidemia, liver enzymes, and hematologic perturbations. And of course, we need to screen for TB before all of these. I haven't mentioned about vaccines. Live vaccines are contraindicated at our institution. We're very aggressive about recommending vaccination for herpes zoster within FDA indications and a shared and informed discussion with all patients, even if they are younger than that indication. There are varying recommendations about sequencing DMARDs and RA that come from groups such as ACR and ULAR, suggesting that biologic DMARDs and targeted synthetic DMARDs are both viable second-line options. And this has changed over the past decade, where there's an early reluctance and then a later embrace of these drugs once patients have failed traditional DMARD therapy. And we should note that not only do patients fail methotrexate, but about one in three patients are either intolerant or have contraindications or are poor candidates for such therapy. Now, these guidelines are constantly being updated. The ACR guidelines as of this time are of 2015 or ancient vintage. The ULAR recommendations have just been recently updated, but the commonality I've already mentioned is methotrexate is the cornerstone of therapy and that we then try to personalize on the basis of shared and informed decision-making how we sequence these drugs. I should mention that both of these guidelines either explicitly or tacitly endorse a treat-to-target strategy where patients have their disease monitored by some metric and then periodically have that metric repeated. And then when the goal is not met, a change in therapy should be seriously considered in an effort to capture a state of either low disease activity or remission. PSA is even a more kind of frenetic work in progress. And I think the reason for that is is that the pipeline for psoriatic arthritis is so rich and there have been so many developments in the past several years that the groups, including ACR and ULAR, but also groups like BRAPA, are having trouble keeping up with all of these changes. So, you know, the comments that I'm making here are kind of a fusion of these guidelines. And we know that in 2020, BRAPA will be coming up with a more updated version of their really refined and highly useful domain-based algorithm. So these guidelines have a few commonalities, you know, that in patients with psoriasis, you have to assess domains. And I'll talk about that in a minute. You know, it's not the same thing to have just arthritis versus axial spondyloarthritis. And a patient may have, you know, nail disease as a psychologically distressing part of their illness and the rest of the domains may be relatively quiet and that may require a totally different therapy. And drugs like methotrexate and nonsteroidals, which may be effective in arthritis and enthesitis, you know, there are things like nails which are not affected and skin to a varying degree. And then the newly approved drugs, including IL-17s, the 1223s, and the JAK inhibitors have not been uniformly accommodated in the present recommendations. I like to approach this disease with two perspectives. The first is to kind of informally quantify the spectrum of disease and the severity of the disease based on how bad the skin is, and how bad, I say the joints, but it's really the musculoskeletal complications. You know, you may have a patient with 2% body surface area of psoriasis, but profound spondyloarthritis or polyarthritis that you are confronting. And on the other hand, there may be somebody with trivial enthesitis, but 30 or 40% body surface area psoriasis with facial involvement and scalp involvement. That really is the critical factor for this patient. So we need to appraise the severity of skin and joints as a good starting point because not all of these drugs are equal against all of these domains. The second part, which has been outlined on the 2016 BRAPA treatment recommendations, 
takes a deeper dive into the domains. And as you can see, these six domains are peripheral arthritis, axial disease, enthesitis, dactylitis, skin, and nails. And then we can mix each one of these up. Is it mild or is it severe? And once we come up with a formula, this patient has very bad nail involvement and skin involvement, which is not highly body surface area severe, but covers facial areas or this person works in a sleeveless environment. On the other hand, the axial disease is not present, but the enthesitis and dactylitis is really interfering with their fine motor skills. Once we have these, then we now have a palette of drugs to pick from. And as you can see, there are still many diseases that we start with traditional DMARDs like methotrexate or other small molecules such as peripheral arthritis, disease domains such as enthesitis, dactylitis, and axial disease can be started with non-steroidals. And then we rapidly move. And whether drugs such as TNF inhibitors have primacy as the next level of therapy is a moving target because IL-17 inhibitors are now ensconced and approved not only for active skin disease, but arthritis and spondylitis, including non-radiographic forms. And the IL-12-23s with very good safety profile also have a role in many of these domains, including enthesitis and dactylitis and arthritis, and now enter JAK inhibitors. And as we're seeing from recent abstracts presented at ULAR 2020, there is the promise though not FDA approved by labeling, that these drugs are going to be just as potent as some of the mainstays from which there are now head-to-head -head comparison drugs for domains such as arthritis, enthesitis, dactylitis, and quality of life measures. So all I can say at this moment, it's a very, very dynamic work in progress. Finally, let me close by a subject that is near and dear to me, and that is the role of non-physician providers in addressing rheumatology workforce shortages. When I talk about this, I'm talking largely about PAs and NPs. These are advanced practitioners, and I have worked incident to an advanced practitioner for the past three decades, and I am sold that this is the optimum way to deliver the best care and the best caring for patients with any disease, but particularly with rheumatic diseases. These advanced practitioners are now highly organized with groups such as RAP and the RNS, and they deserve our full respect and to be involved in all educational programs that physician providers have available to them. So I am totally all in. The studies that have gone on in these areas show an increasing amount of independence that we should be embracing to help stave off this manpower shortage and their degree of comfort with many of the common inflammatory diseases is well deserved. I like to think of the practice of rheumatology as a team sport where I might have certain things to offer perhaps in a better way than my nurse practitioner Betsy who has many things to offer in a better way than I do for our patients. But I look at it as synergy where two plus two equals five. I'd like to conclude with a few points about RA and PSA, starting with the fact that these relatively common inflammatory arthritides share many features clinically and immunopathogenically, but have many aspects that are distinct that have driven the development of somewhat overlapping but distinct care pathways. Secondly, we now have a palette of drugs, including traditional DMARDs, targeted therapies, and a growing list of oral targeted synthetic therapies that are very exciting, the sequencing of which is still a work in progress, but I think that within this year we will have a greater degree of clarity. This is really great for the patient and for the provider to have a greater number of options. And finally, not only stay on top of the guidelines, which are a work in progress, but I think you already know that these partnerships can continuously be refined for better care and caring of our patients. I think it provides a bright future. So thank you much for tuning in, and please come back for more of these programs. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash ZHN860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Pfizer.
This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.